When I'm speaking, there's a little bit of friction. What is it? It will be something not positive. That's the difference between where, where you're coming at all of this from and where I'm coming at all of this from. Whenever you're in a backwards world, you kind of have to carve out for yourself a sanctuary that's going the opposite direction within that backwards world. I could never forget non-physical reality. I'm literally looking at it all day long. Now, this offers truths to me that other people do not see. Most people you want to be like, oh, is there this multi-dimensional process that I can do to heal all this trauma? And I'm like, look, it's this simple. It's these really tangible actions, actually, that change the pattern and that do the most for ancestral healing. How have you navigated your own human shadow in the light of so much public perception? Oh, this is the hell of my life. To be honest with you, it's become harder and harder to hold on to my light, not the shadow. Because of how often you acquaint yourself with people who love you to death, only to become your greatest haters later. There are entire aspects of my personality which people have decided don't get to exist. Often, great tragedies are required for humanity to have the opportunity to awaken. What do you see is to come? Society is the sum of its pieces. So if the individuals within a society are doing this work, and you see them wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, it causes a massive shift within the society itself. By doing so, even when you've got such powerful forces against you, you can be in profound levels of alignment. And therefore, your life experience is going to be different from that place. Hello, beautiful beings. Welcome back to the Know Thyself podcast, where every single week we get the honor and privilege to sit down with a brilliant mind to learn more about the true nature of self and the world around us at deeper levels every single week. Our guest today is a spiritual thinker, teacher, speaker, author. She really supports people from all walks of life with trauma, healing, and the whole awakening process. And today we're going to be diving deep into ancestral healing, unlocking our spiritual gifts, the dynamics of relationships, and so much more. So I'm looking forward to it. Teal Swan, thanks for being here. It's good to be here. Yeah. So I want to start with you about uh, personality, actually, because I think largely who we presume that we are, and this being the Know Thyself podcast, we really like to focus on who we think we are in the self, um, is accumulated impressions, these memories of who we think we are, passed down information from our ancestry. And that conditioning then becomes the color tinted glasses in which we look through life. And um, we think that it's us. And so I would love for you to share what you think about the personality as you work with so many humans from all walks of life. When you look at somebody's personality, are you how, how have you um, reframed that to allow people to tap into something deeper? I have an interesting answer to this because I encourage people to embrace their personality in the same way that I encourage them to embrace the ego. But the personality is largely a construct that is an amalgamation of those adaptations which made each person safest in the environment that they specifically grew up in. So we can't really look at the personality as it has developed throughout life and say that that's truly who, all of who somebody is. It is part of who somebody is, though. So we have to be able to hold the dichotomy of it's an element of self, but it also is not the full story of self. I think the beauty in doing that is that there's some flexibility around the self. And what I notice when people are really wanting to find themselves is they're looking for something so profoundly solid something that will not change, you know? <laughs> and that's not the nature of identity, so. Mm. Yeah, I, I definitely don't, I think we're such fluid creatures and we could identify with so many different aspects of ourselves that are parts, but not of the whole. And so what do you look at when you see the different parts of ourselves that make us who we are? When somebody just comes to you and is trying to find themselves, obviously personality or the ego self is one perspective, but then what's the full full pie? The full pie is perfect awareness of all elements of the self. So I'm trying to draw attention to the, the element that does not change. That's like the consciousness or the witness consciousness that is essentially both watching and putting on this whole show. At the same time as helping a person to become aware of all these different aspects of themselves. Because so many aspects of self maybe other people see, but a person themselves doesn't see. So when somebody comes to me and they say, I want to find myself, all that means to me is I want to become more and more and more and more aware of what is going on that I identify with, that I call me. Okay, then we have we have to look at job. We have to look at ancestry. We have to look at um, your connection to your non-physical consciousness. We have to look at the types of unsafety you face and the adaptations you made to that. We have to look at your values. It's a very long list. Mm -hmm. 
one of the things on that very long list, which you've spent a lot of time recently focusing on is the ancestral healing side of things. And so I'd love for you to share why you've put so much importance recently with your work on delineating the different differences between our, our mother and our father lineages and both the gifts and the challenges that we've inherited. I mean, as a shadow worker, you can't you can't not be about a person's origins. The problem is, is that we're incredibly limited when we think about our origins. The vast majority of people who are doing healing work or integrative work are taking a person back to just what they in their individual lifetime have experienced. Beyond that, a lot of people are focused on past lives and none of this takes into account the thing that perhaps influences who we are in this life, our identity that we chose into before we came here, the portions of our identity we chose into before we came here, as our ancestral lineage does. It's the cards that you chose before coming here. So not really having a, an awareness about that is like not knowing what cards you're playing with in life. And that's sad for a myriad of reasons. One of the reasons why we came down into this kind of a construct is to say, I want to create expansion in this family line. So every individual that's born into a family comes into that family as the progression for that family line. That means that each and every one of us took on the challenge of embodying those elements of mastery that come through a family line whilst alchemizing the elements that are not necessarily serving the family line. That's serious consciousness work. It's saying, okay, maybe for so many generations, our families just expected the worst to happen. Now my expectation of the worst to happen is setting me up so that I, I can't even use the laws that govern this time-space reality to create. So that probably doesn't serve us anymore. I need to be the one to change that. I just think it's very powerful for people to understand where the origin is of these things that they're experiencing and also to recognize patterns within the whole, not just patterns within the self, because we're looking at a microcosm of the macrocosm when we're looking at an individual's life. All of us are experiencing ancestral trauma. We're carrying on those, those deals from grandparents, great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents without even knowing it. And I, what I've noticed is that when people become aware of that whole story, it enables them to take ownership of something but also to depersonalize it at the same time. It actually, what I've noticed is puts them more in a space of empowerment about, all right, if that's how it has been and it hasn't been serving, what do I do differently? Also, recognizing those very powerful elements that you don't even need to work on. I mean, some family lines have already mastered abundance, for example. How great to be like, all right, I may be working on relationships in this lifetime, but I don't have any issue with money. And to just own that is, okay, I, I'm, I'm playing with some aces. <laughs> so much of the focus, I think, when it comes to healing work is like, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? And so it's good to give people some of those power cards to become conscious of and be like, oh, confidence. Yeah. So I'm excited to dive deeper into both the challenges and the gift side of things. How important do you, because you mentioned, how important do you feel like is it to delineate where in time and space the story of an origin actually even started? Because we might have this behavioral compensation for people pleasing or abandonment or whatever it is, but how necessary is it that we find, you know, where it started? Can we just observe the pattern and work with it in real time? I don't know how to quantify this for you because I'm one of those people who will tell you that the more information you have, the more conscious you're going to be about changing the whole thing. But it's not like I'm going to draw a line and say it's absolutely necessary. Why? Because the patterns that are still active from within your ancestral line are going to be affecting you in your day-to-day -day life. It's just that most people don't know that. Most people, when they're dealing with you know, an issue with success or an issue with their relationships, they don't see that the origin started before their time with a great-grandparent or, or a parent or something. They're really not looking at that level of things. But let's say that they had no awareness of it. They were adopted or something, and they've still got this thing going on. They wouldn't necessarily have to know that to change it in their own life. They are doing ancestral healing anyway. It's just most of us can relate to that juicy, incredible, almost crystallized feeling of being like, oh, wait, oh my gosh, look, there's emotional abandonment running through my dad's line. Like I can see it in the way that they, that his parents interacted with him. Wait, where did that come from? Now going back to your great-grandparents being like, oh, that's weird. 
you know, he grew up in this time in this place and this is how he was raised because of whatever war, for example. It crystallizes the, the why behind the whole thing for people. So it's just like the better it gets, the better it gets. Mm -hmm. But what I'm really wanting to do for people is to have them recognize these patterns and these patterns as they occur across history. Most especially because right now in the world, let's just say that ancestral trauma that is playing out on a mass scale is about to repeat in a very serious way, in a way we would do very well to avoid. So if we can't recognize these patterns within ourselves, they're going to play out again. So I want to go into the how side of things in the moment, like the process of letting go mm -hmm. those narratives and all of that. But first, I just want you to speak to the power of on an individual level, realizing the ripple effects that that healing has, you know, because when you actually transmute that within yourself, you know, some traditions say seven generations back and forward, you heal that. So then the suffering isn't passed on to your future generation. And so just, yeah, talk about the importance of doing this inner work. Because <laughs> you didn't just cover it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Well, obviously, when, when you're, whenever you take a, a pattern, a frequency, just, it's repeating, just like over and over again, and maybe the way that it's repeating is causing some kind of a detrimental effect, any alteration we make to that pattern, it alters the effect. So essentially, what we're doing is clearing up everything in our lines so that what comes next can be the progression rather than the repetition of some kind of a pattern. Now, we, we can understand how that works in our own life, right? How that works in our own life is maybe I've had an issue because of, you know, mom or dad with um, emotional availability, right? Now, I recognize that. I start working like anybody would on something they recognize in themselves they don't really like very much. I start working on being more available emotionally. Now, let's say that I've got a, a child and I'm more emotionally available for that child. That child is not going to experience the same kind of emotional experiences in their relationships that the child would have if I had just continued on with that that pattern of emotional unavailability. Now that, the ripple effect of this, like I literally will not be able to go into it deep enough because we could be here for days and days and days and days for this. But just to give you like a small little sprinkling of a taste of this, let's say that this child now, unlike everybody else in the family line, has emotional availability. Because of that, this child does not become an addict because emotional neglect is really the root of most addictions, mm. if not arguably all of them. So <laughs> let's say that because this child does not become an addict, their energy is channeled more into their passions. Now let's just pretend that in this, this case, this child's passion is architecture. Life path number one with emotional neglect becomes an addict, ends up in the street. Life path number two, not an addict, becomes an architect that starts to design the new earth. Are you serious right now? Now, if you just start to play that out on that person's partners, that person's children, that person's friends, it just starts to be like the ripples around this, right? That even impacts their interaction with the, the pets they have. It's everything you touch. Hmm. It feels completely infinite to the degree. It's like one interaction that the healed version, life path number two, would have an interaction with one person and how that affects how he shows up in his life. It's like it's impossible to quantify, but the, the impact is very real and felt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, when you, when you get up to that level where you can see that all these ripple effects, it's so mind-blowing and it, it changes your reactions to things. I'm noticing this in myself a lot when I'm spending time with people. When people are not at that level where they see the ripple effects easily, it's like they don't take things seriously. Whereas if you see those ripple effects, you may be freaking out at something and most people are like, what is your deal? Like, this is not a big deal. You're like, you don't understand. You do this in 30 years from now, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely makes life more difficult, but yeah. it's the reality, whether we want to accept it or not. For sure. So getting the context and the understanding like we spoke to is valuable. The more that we can understand yeah. where the origins, regardless if you have awareness as to what the pattern is, that's a pl starting place no matter how much context of the story of where it originated from is. But uh, then what is the process once awareness to a certain degree, because there's levels of awareness, is established, then the process of actually transmuting it. I know there's many different ways, but what have you found as the like, most effective modalities in actually being able to release those? 
You know what's funny is I, I my answer is actually it's not as esoteric as most people want to go. Most people, especially when they meet people like me, want to be like, oh, is there this multidimensional thing, process that I can do to heal all this trauma? And I'm like, look, it's this simple. Recognize the pattern. What's the pattern change? Action, thought, in the direction of that change. End of story. It's about, it's about free will. It's about exerting your free will to change that pattern. So recognizing something that's detrimental, what would the... I don't even want to say opposite. What would the healing experience be? What would the opposite action be? And then carrying that out. Now, you can do that on the level of just like recognizing a trauma that needs some kind of resolution or recognizing a detrimental behavior that needs you to behave in a different way. But this can go as far as recognizing things like ancestral um, karma. So if we look back in our past quite often our, our ancestors created some kind of negative karma for us. And really all that is is also a pattern, right? It's just the law of cause and effect in action. So, all right, let's say that way back in the day, I realized that the people in my family may have exploited a certain kind of animal, right? Okay, well, what would be clearing karma for that? Something that I actually want to own. Well, maybe it's helping that animal instead. So it's these really tangible actions, actually, that change the pattern that do the most for ancestral healing. Like, sure, you can do transcendental meditations or medicine work where you meet your ancestors and do, you know, all this airy-fairy stuff. But, And I love that stuff, don't get me wrong, but it's it's like this is not the level that, it, that creates the most impact. Sure, yeah. I know people don't like that. They like the magic stuff. <laughs> There's going to be plenty of magic in this conversation. So... And this is magic. What do you feel about the difference between fully feeling those feelings? Like mm. if it boils down to some sort of grief that needs to be fully mm. felt versus actually just seeing how it's not real. You know, it's like the impartial part of us that can see that it's illusory. Like how do you, what do you see the efficacy of both of those paths? I'm so glad you're asking me this question because this drives me crazy. <laughs> <sighs> okay, I'm trying to, mm-hmm. I'm trying to back up off of my own personal trigger around this. I actually, I have a big issue with people in the spiritual field who come at life with this attitude of it's an illusion. It's not. This dimension here, which we are currently experiencing, is not an illusion. It is a construct we have created, which is very real. So is the opposite. So when people say, looking at something as if it's an illusion, it is to nullify an entire reality with some other reality. What we need to be doing is to be able to expand our perspective, to be able to hold dichotomies. That means here in this time-space reality, there is absolutely death. There is absolutely loss. In another dimensional reality, there's no death and there's no loss. Both are true. So it's, it's about the, the process of expanding our perspective to be able to hold both. What that creates is, is usually this it's a kind of an energy where that that more witness consciousness, which is, of course, more part of those dimensional fields where things are an illusion, are able to come in and, and really hold the process of you going through the, the grief, for example. They're able to validate that experience rather than invalidate that experience. What we have in the spiritual field is mass escapism. I am very much in favor of going through the emotions, feeling those feelings, while at the same time holding that there's this whole other other truth within the universe. It is possible to hold both. It's just that human consciousness wants black or white. We don't want to be able to hold both. Hmm. Is your own personal trigger on that because you just have been exposed to the... I've watched how much extreme damage is done in the spiritual field by teachers who teach from that platform. Mm-hmm. It's, I mean, it's one of those things where when you see the ripple effects, it's like, it's very hard to not get, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I hear I hear you. Yeah, I think there's a lot of value in what you just shared. Are you open to sharing a little bit more of your own personal father and mother lineages and yeah. the, the trauma or challenges? Oh, yeah, sure. It's like that. all of that. Yeah. I don't know where to start right now. <laughs> Pick your favorite. <laughs> My dad's line. <laughs> um, 
Okay, where should I go with that though? Like, yeah. there's so I I know so much that it's like I don't know where to All start right. off. What would, what would you say is like the the most dominant wound that came from that side and potentially gift? We could do both okay. for each. The most dominant gift that came from my father's side would definitely be um, endeavor. It's a very interesting family line because they came to, I'm mean, talking like all lines of this family, came to America very, very early. When I say very early, I'm talking Jamestown, Mayflower. The energy around this family is, is always like the new horizon. They're entrepreneurs. My forefathers on that side were literally the, they were the forefathers of, of American business tycoons who came here to create whatever life they wanted to create for themselves. And so I, I continue to, to watch in this family line, just this constant endeavor. Like I tell, I'm telling you, like if we decide to colonize the moon, that family line's like, we're there, you know? Um, the detrimental aspect that runs through that family line is there's no attachment. I mean, if you're going to just leave everything behind and go to a new world and just keep doing that over and over and over again, there can't really be a bond to anything or anyone around you. So there's like an emotional vacuum or an attachment vacuum. It's like, hey, Johnny, I know you were just born. You're never going to know me. I've got better things to be focused on. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. So I definitely suffered from that. Um, on the mom's side. So that's both the gift and the wound, the endeavor. No, the, yeah, actually, in a little bit. I, I think one plays off the other. Sure. Note. You'll notice that's often the case. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so for mom's side, the gift that's coming through that line is something that I call the lamb. It's actually, it's like a, a frequency that's very near Christ consciousness. There's an innocence that runs through the children in that line, which is super divine, and it comes with a lot of spiritual gifts. The problem is, is that the lamb very quickly finds itself in extreme amounts of darkness and trauma. And the question is, is it going to stay pure or is it going to become corrupted? And the answer is, quite often, it becomes corrupted. In that line, to be honest with you, I'm a little, it's like daunting. I, it's a little bit overwhelming. And by a little bit, I mean a lot with the sheer amount of abuse and just this insane repetition of senseless tragedies. So running through that line, and I definitely see it in myself, is just a constant panic attack about bad things are going to happen, really bad things are going to happen, because they always did. And I'm talking really bad, really freak accident level stuff. So we're trying to, uh, we're trying to break through that relationship with the universe, which is proving very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad you can laugh at it. <laughs> Some days. Yeah, yeah. So when you look back, because that, that mother side lineage feels like there's just a lot of weight and, and oh, so much there and feels like is what has activated so much of your life path and gifts now and all of that. And like you spoke to the gifts and the challenges are kind of tied inherently in there. Um, when you see that and you feel that from your mom's side, like, if you're open to sharing one example of like what, what is that dark possibility of that lamb that then falls into the dark side of things? And then we can go into, you know, how you were able to unlock more of your gifts. Well, I mean, that, that tragedy played out in my life. And it definitely can lead down the road of just giving up on everything because you're just going to suffer. So definitely the manifestation within my own life is, is suicidality. What it is, is it's like I, there, there has to be sort of almost like an access to the light that's underneath that whole thing. So where I keep returning to to try to resolve this, and I, I'm, it's probably going to be better places that I discover, is finding moments of joy. Like when you're in a prison cell, is it possible to be maybe looking at a puddle on the side of the room and the way the light reflects off that puddle and to recognize the beauty in a moment of absolute tragedy. I'm not going to say that it makes the rest of it worth it. It certainly hasn't yet, but 
it's very, when you're getting consumed by that sort of darkness and that misery, it's very hard to let light penetrate. And I've definitely watched so many people in that family line where the light no longer penetrates. And they're no longer able to access their own vulnerability. That's another danger that I've watched in myself. It's like you just, you, be, you have to adapt to so much extreme misfortune that you just become an inaccessible person in terms of the vulnerable aspects of self. There's a vulnerability along with this powerful lightness to that lamb energy. So how do we stay connected to that even in the worst moments is the question. So in those moments of our development where we felt unsafe, then we create bar barriers to that pain, but then also that creates barriers to the upper limits of our joy and gifts and yep. all of that. Is there a dominant moment, a pivotal moment that sticks out when you really broke through to, to that barrier and got access to the depth of the pain and then also on the other side? Yeah, I would say that's a continual process for me. Yeah. But let me think about a moment. Mm -hmm. About two years ago, I was working on like a superiority complex because I was starting to recognize that in myself. The way that it manifested is no matter what room I walked in, I was like, I can do everything that people are doing better than they can do it. It's annoying me. It was starting to cause me pain actually because it just feels like you're by yourself surrounded by idiots. Yeah. So I was, I was first starting to witness the fact that that superiority dynamic that I was going into must be some kind of a coping mechanism and covering for something. And it definitely was. It originated from feeling like I could not trust anybody in childhood and therefore had to overcompensate by essentially doing everybody's job better so that at least I had some kind of control. When you're caught up in the superiority complex, it's like you don't you don't actually have access to the vulnerability that creates it because you're just feeling kind of that hit of self-esteem. It's not until, like I said, you feel the pain that comes with that, which is that incredible isolation that you're like, wait a minute, this is a problem. Um, before that, it's just like, <laughs> look at me comparatively. Um, yeah. So I was able to drop down into that, that absolute terror of just being like, oh no, like if I put myself in somebody's hands and they're worse, then what is that? What does that mean for me? It was all around danger, right? So I allowed myself to go through the terror and I'm talking, it was like burn your body up level somatic terror. What was really interesting is that what came out of that, and it, it's not like I went and tried to do it. I sat with that emotion so long and so deeply and so intensely that that sort of burning pain of the superiority and the fear that was underneath it dissipated. And what was left was this very strong awareness and recognition, almost like I couldn't see it before, of being able to see excellence in a much more crystallized way. I was able to see the elements where I have more power than other people because there is a genuine superiority in that moment and where other people are in a position of superiority. Now, that sounds really funny for people because, especially in the spiritual field, um, that word superiority, inferiority, is not well received. In fact, it's all about equality for people. But that is not that is not a thing. It's not a thing. This is a very unpopular opinion that I have, but I feel like it's very necessary for people to hear. We are not living in a plane of equality. Like we can have a, a conversation around equality of, you know, purpose and value of the soul and things like that. But if you line up one person with another person and you go, okay, jump. There's going to be a superiority established in terms of who's a better jumper. Um, let's say you have somebody who went to flight school. Now you have that person behind the, the wheel of a plane and me. There's going to be a superiority. Wherever somebody has that element of excellence or that element of skill, you've got a power disparity. What's so important to recognize is that power disparity. Not only because it's dangerous when you don't recognize the power that you have or the power that other people have, but it's really inefficient when in a moment you could be like, you know what, this is your area and you're the one that's excellent at this. Take the wheel. We actually get somewhere much faster as a human race even when we, when we look at each other in this way rather than trying to constantly level the playing field. I also feel like when you are able to recognize where you have some element of superiority to the people around you, you're actually able to, to give away that power and recognize where other people are excellent and where they have the power. Yeah. So what I'm noticing is it doesn't, I mean, the, the, so almost the power struggle goes away. 
And that's really beautiful because you're not in this constant fight. You're also not feeling the constant isolation that I was feeling previously. You're able to get along in a much more harmonious way. People feel safer when you recognize their power. There's not as much jockeying. I'm, and like the list goes on and on and on and on. So I hope that's a good example. Yeah. Well, I want to I want to pick up on a couple of things you said because that superiority complex is, I feel like, always inherently tied to self-righteousness and anger that's deep-seated. And as somebody that stepped into the arena of the public light and especially being <laughs> as a spiritual teacher, there can often be people kind of fall into the field that you create for yourself and there can be this external appearance and like deification from the outside in which leaves less space for the messiness of teal's humanity you know oh there is no space for that keep going i didn't mean to no but that's that's (laughs) like to feel that like there's no space for that you know it's for anybody who's stepping into this space like you should run away from fame unless you have to be in the limelight for some important reason I know that's a sad statement, but it's true. How So how have you nav- navigated your own human shadow in, in the light of so much public perception? To be honest with you, it's become harder and harder to hold on to my light, not the shadow. I find this, I always find this funny because people are like, oh, you're in the public eye. Um, you're constantly getting sort of flooded with deification. I actually feel the exact opposite. Also, what I'm losing touch with is, what I'm noticing that I'm losing touch with over the years is a felt sense of my importance for the people who I do matter for. Because of how often you acquaint yourself with people who love you to death only to become your greatest haters later. And that creates a dynamic where when people are like, I love your stuff, you're like, just wait. So what I'm noticing is that what's more magnifying and magnifying that, you know, I'm having to work with constantly, constantly, constantly is the negative reflections. Constant negative reflections, constant fights in terms of, you know, power struggles. Constantly, why should I be listening to you? And it's getting worse and worse with the younger generations because they don't want it. They don't want, they actually leveled the playing field with fame. To, To a large degree, what social media platforms did was it gave everybody the impression that they can be in this position. So they're like, who are you? Yeah. There is that public, like, when people perceive somebody that has a heightened level of awareness and has more answers to dimensions of life that they're, they can often put them on that pedestal. And then like we spoke to, it doesn't give as much space for your own humanity. And so I want you to speak into a little bit more of like when, when you fall and and you fall into your shadow or you mess up or you get angry or whatever it is, (laughs) and you're surrounded by individuals that don't expect that for you, or maybe don't have the bandwidth or capacity to hold you in that space, then how do you relate to that in your own way? Oh, this is the hell of my life. It's literally the hell of my life. Like there are entire aspects of my personality which people have decided don't get to exist because it doesn't fit into their mental idea of what somebody would be like if they did have all of this interdimensional awareness. There's a big perception, especially within, I think, my field, that somebody who's got all this access to information somehow loses their humanity because of the awareness of that that information. And by humanity, I mean the elements of self which people reject. Things like impulses, things like strong desire, things like uh, emotionality. So there's an expectation which especially impacted me of non-reactivity. It's expected that I should be, I mean, beaten to within an inch of my life and react like. So it's become extremely painful because the second they see that in you, they rip you down to the ground because they can't hold both. So, it, I mean, really it's the end of human relationships when you walk down a path where people expect something different than who you are. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so much of your work is focusing on that human relationship dynamic and also relation to just all life. But first, I would love for you to share, and I want, I'm curious if it's tied to that tattoo, the, the alchemization process of whatever the, the shadow is and it comes up cup as, what is, so what is that tattoo? I'm just curious. <laughs> this tattoo is the seal of alchemy. So the ancient alchemists, they didn't want people to come across what they knew about the universe. 
Now, this may sound funny to people because here in these fields, we've been talking about mind creates reality. Like, of course it does. Duh, that's like old information and it's not interesting anymore. But when they first tripped on this idea that mind creates reality was like the biggest deal ever, they were like, this is the most insane alchemical concept. If our enemies get this, they're going to like destroy Earth. So <laughs> they hid their knowledge in symbols. So the center of this tattoo means the void, that which is nothingness. And we could look at that as pure potential energy. Activated by thought and purified by universal energy equals manifestation. So the fact that there's a circle in the center and the outside means that which is everythingness is that which is nothingness. The ultimate message in this is it's mind that creates out of the potential of all energy in this universe. We are mind, and we're activating the mind, and we're creating with the mind. The universe is mental. It's very mind heavy. <laughs> I'm curious to dive a little bit deeper into the uh, the gift side of things, because like we spoke to earlier, the whole, the challenge becomes the way, the trauma, the difficulty then unlocks some sort of light side if you're able to <laughs> transmute that, go on the process of alchemization. We, and talk, we talked about Teal's bad mood about life right now. <laughs> <laughs> so what were those gifts that you felt inherent as you came into this life, what were like the clear, you know, abilities that you had, aptitudes? I'm like a laser for truth. It was always that way. Um, used to drive my parents absolutely crazy because when you're when you're trying to hold it together and make your life appear a certain way, and I'm like, it's not that way. This is how it is. You're like, Shh, we don't say things like that in public. Uh, uh, yeah, I had a real gift for that. Um, Obviously, my intuitive centers have been so blown open. I don't even want to say blown open. Um, it's kind of the opposite. Like A lot of people like to look at what I'm dealing with as a major gift, and we can look at it from that angle, but it's in fact a disability. I came in with a disability to fully plug into this time-space reality. Most people, when they come into this physical dimension, as if you were to become an avatar inside of a, a video game construct, the avatar is all there is, and there's actually a lot of benefit to that. But obviously there's a detriment too. You lose touch with the rest of, of the existence, the person sitting on the couch, for example, and I was never able to do that. So we could, we could talk about the negative aspects that came with that, but the positive aspects, these things we could call gifts that come with that, is that I could never forget non-physical reality. I'm literally looking at it all day long. Now, this offers truths to me that other people do not see. They would have to ingest a whole lot of DMT in order to see the stuff that I'm just like looking at on a daily basis. Such as? I'm watching energy fields. When people feel emotion, I can actually visually see them in the auric field. Um, I, I'm able to hear entities that are disembodied. Um, I've got internal innate knowings, prophecies. I mean, a lot of things that people would be like, oh, I'd be so psyched to be able to develop that gift. You know what I mean? I came in with that when I was really little. So I don't know the world separate from that. I also, there's a lot more flexibility, you'll notice, within my psyche because I don't see solid objects. I don't get what that means. Um, I tr I've tried to talk to people about this because obviously we don't all see the same thing. And so when you meet somebody who sees stuff totally different, you want to almost dissect what it is that they're seeing versus what you're seeing. So I've tried to do this, especially in my early 20s. But, you know, it's been explained to me that like people, when they are looking at an object in themselves or a person in themselves, they see like negative space, like nothing. Like I can't conceptualize of what nothing looks like because there's like all of these energy fields are bleeding into one another, constantly moving. So an object is really just a thing that is becoming dense. But you've got all these layers condensing to that density. So as opposed to seeing like a body that gives off an auric field, it's the auric field that's condensing to form the physical body. It's a whole different worldview when you experience life like that. Yeah, yeah, when you're tapping into those extrasensory perceptions and- Yeah, but I don't even need to tap in, that's the problem. I, I had to do the reverse. It was like, oh no, I'm a little kid who's, <laughs> the table doesn't, yeah, the table doesn't start here, the table starts way out there. So I'm like walking, unnecessarily far around objects and running into things that I'm thinking you can walk through and having to teach myself to act normal. Mm -hmm. 
let's talk trying to put makeup on when you when you know the the place where you put makeup on on the skin is just like a certain point of density. You have to learn where that point of density is. Yeah, and otherwise you're like, this is great eye makeup. It looks so good. You know. <laughs> I could see how you can perceive it both from that being an incredible ability for how many people you're able to help with that, but then also the disability of the burden of seeing things that you don't necessarily want to have to always see. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it makes you have to carve a life out for yourself is what it does. Uh -huh. When anybody's got as extreme uh, disability gifts as somebody like me, it's like, <laughs> it, I mean, could you imagine me in a nine to five job? It's not going to happen. I'm not going to let you get away with calling it a disability all the time. You have to switch between back <laughs> both of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah I've, I've had to carve out a life where what i'm seeing is benefiting people and what i'm seeing is making sense otherwise i'm probably going to enter into a normal job and somebody's going to have me institutionalized mm. yeah i feel like there's a lot so many individuals who are institutionalized had incredible gifts that oh yeah they don't have the right frame oh yeah the houses for our greatest mystics are now the asylums yeah that's welcome to the western world this was a serious point of pain when i was younger because obviously, like, I'm born to these two incredibly scientific parents. I mean incredibly. They're both environmental scientists. They are, like, they were not spiritual. Now, all of a sudden, they've got this kid that's like, Mom, everybody's got colors. <laughs> Look at the yellow guy. She's like, what the fuck is going on? Um, yeah, and what was sad is, like, I, I even watched this in my own parents, just them being torn between, okay, well, we can very obviously see if this child is able to predict you know, prostate cancer is probably something amazing to that. At the same time, like, maybe she's really mentally ill and we need to go see someone. And it was difficult just knowing that if I was raised in the Eastern world in a different culture, immediately I would have been identified as, you know, somebody that belongs as a healer or a sage. I would have been absorbed into the group of people that exist that are already doing that and trained up real nice. Instead, it was just a nightmare of having to extricate myself from a society that sees most of this as illness. And over and over again, when I deal with people who are struggling immensely with mental illness that fall on the spectrum of actually I'm seeing too much, it's heartbreaking because we're losing so much value in what these people see and mm. what they could create. Have you had clear perception as to... Like, do you feel like people choose where and when they incarnate and why you have taken this life where you did and the difficulty of maybe not being embraced by Eastern individuals that would have understood you? Um, yeah. ha has that understanding eased your tension around it? No. I know that everybody wants the opposite. Everyone's like, well, when you see the whole reason, it just makes all the pain go away. No, mm -hmm. it doesn't. You still went through hell. What it is when you when you can make sense of it is you can sign up for it instead of just being your whole life fighting against what it is that you went through. Yeah. It kind of enables you to take a step forward, I guess. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I understand exactly why I chose all this crap. Right. I would be a pretty piss poor teacher, honestly. I'd be just like so many other people who get into this and they're so tapped into these other dimensions that they're, they're just almost in a state of... Why would you have a problem with this? You know, <laughs> I would be inaccessible if I hadn't gone through the amount of pain in my own life. Did you experience, especially the Western mind thinks so dualistically in black and white. Um, and as somebody who's kind of seeing oftentimes like non-physical and um, seeing things within the grander horizon of what is happening within the context, the bigger context. I'm just curious a little bit more for you to feel into when you perceive individuals that think in such dualistic ways, um, how to support them in, you know, removing the trap that they set up for themselves and thinking always in black and white. I usually draw their attention to an aspect of themselves where they experience pain when somebody thinks about them that way. Almost everybody can come up with something. Like, let's say I'm dealing with a, a straight up businessman somewhere. I'm like, all right. Is there some aspect of you that you feel like you can't have because of your professional career? Most people are like, oh, yeah, okay. Like maybe maybe over here I need to be so – I need to be taken seriously. But over here, like I'm actually a real geek or a real nerd. All right. Well, there's a dichotomy. Don't you so badly want people to be able to hold both of these things rather than use one to negate the other? 
make one wrong, make one right. And usually they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, well, what if all of life is that way? Most people, when they, when you're able to relate it to themselves, they are usually able to come with you. Mm-hmm. So let's dive a little bit deeper into relationships now. <laughs> you really want to go there? I, I want to. <laughs> it's like every time I try to think of maybe going into a direction that's not just the shadow and like the <laughs> the weight of what we hold. It's like, all right, well, that's probably going to happen again here in this next <laughs> section because. Um, all life is relation and you should have just called me and said, Teal, I want you to be inspirational today. <laughs> Don't be honest. No, I want you to be all of it. I want you to be whatever is real in the moment and alive. Mm-hmm. So let's let's keep flowing with it. So I want to go explore from both the masculine and feminine perspective. Okay. For for as men and, and women, one big pattern I see often within men is the trait of uh, niceness versus kindness. Aha. Aha. Oh, okay. oh now she's activated. <laughs> so I want you to speak to being nice as a behavioral compensation versus the genuine arising of being kind and how people get those two confused. Niceness specifically is a behavior that is an adaptive strategy designed to keep you safe within the social stratosphere. It's a placation is what it is. It's I need you to like me so that I'm safe. So we're going to behave in this way that makes you like me so that I'm safe. That's nice. Kindness comes from a much more grounded, rooted place where you're able to actually practice love. Love is to take the other as a part of the self, period, the end. It's not all this fancy other stuff that we like to make love mean, like, oh, positive focus and appreciation and whatever else, right? I want the person. It's really just as simple. I take you as a part of me. Now, if somebody is able to do that with someone, they are taking the other person's best interests as a part of their own. Now, I'm able to act kind because what I'm able to do, it's not about you liking me. It's about me acting in your best interests. But of course, to be kind, you really have to be tapped into whatever another person's best interests are. You can't just be in a narcissistic state where you're like, I know what's best for you though, even without listening and paying attention. It's just narcissism. But um, you'll notice that the people who are practicing kindness They're not always loved by other people, not always liked by other people, because they tend to be putting themselves in positions where they do essentially what is right for the other, Mm. even in situations where that person may not want that. Yeah. And I feel like people can always subconsciously pick up on the inauthenticity of it. Mm -hmm. They might be like just holding themselves constantly at an arm's length distance because they can feel that there is like a there's some sort of facade that they're interacting through. Well, it's also profoundly narcissistic. Nice, nice people, especially nice guys, are super narky. <laughs> because that niceness always comes down to some deep-seated fear. It's it's an instinct to self-preserve. And that's where, as a female, you can't be with a nice guy. Why? Because the nice guy is going to let the lion eat your throat for the sake of his own safety. <laughs> Is there another big self-preservation tendency that you see within the masculine that's, that sticks out as one of the big ones? Yeah, the refusal to access vulnerability. Now, obviously, you see these, these two shadows playing out very differently in different demographics, but even racial demographics, you see. <sighs> There's a lot of demographics where the issue that men are facing and the self-preservation instinct is, I'm always strong, I'm always tough. Well, that's not really the case, is it? And you're not really caretaking vulnerable aspects of the self. And so pretty soon the the universe puts you in a position where you're so effing vulnerable. What are you going to do then? Usually that's an illness or some kind of an accident or some kind of an extreme loss, you know? Oh, you know, the whole self-esteem, your your sort of machismo attitude all hung on this thing. Guess what? It's gone now, you know? (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, that's a big one and I work with individuals like in my men's group and with with a lot of men who are trying to access more of who they really are which is going to be inherently inhibited when you're holding yourself back from being able to experience um, those core vulnerabilities Uh, of course masculine and feminine are just energy systems at different scales within each men and woman on the flip side what do you feel like is one of the biggest themes for women that that's uh, most prevalent Niceness is a big deal within the feminine. Yeah, I hear that. Manipulation is the biggest one I watch within women. 
Hmm. And this one, see, we got to go back in history for this one. <sighs> All right, if we're having a real conversation, quite early men decided to dominate females, not in a sexy way, not in a like, oh, that's a great bedroom etiquette kind of way. Um, in a real like, I'm going to decide what happens with you, regardless of whether it's in your best interest or not. So that kind of control dynamic puts women in this position for thousands of years where the only way for them to really be able to empower themselves and bring about what they want is through men. Now, if that's the only way they can do it, they got to manipulate the men around them. They got to manipulate the women around them too. So they're manipulative as hell. And to get a woman to recognize their manipulation, be honest and straightforward and assertive instead is very difficult, but it's the way forward for women. Hmm. That's one example. Yeah. Well, that manipulation could manifest in so many different ways. Like you said, niceness is a sort of manipulation, mm -hmm. uh, trying to you know, cultivate a certain appearance. Triangulation is what women do best. Triangulation. What they do is they sense, they sense your, your uh, pain points relative to other people. And then they secretly get behind what is a real pain point that you have with somebody else and go and fan the flames. Mm. And then they say whatever makes you feel good in that situation. So they establish rapport with you against someone. Because they often, women have more of that emotional awareness, whereas men are probably just more dumb about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh man, they can smell it. Uh -huh. It's like, it's like, it's like, you know, when you get the taste of blood, oh, women are so good at that. Uh. They know exactly how you feel with everybody in your life. Yeah. So that's one example. So another example that I see a lot with women is that is actually post 1960s movement. So when it's still coming out of the same thing, you watch for so many years, women being in a position where they don't have any power over the course of their own lives, right? And they're watching men are the ones that have the power over their own lives. And so we want what men have. So you watch the 1960s come into play and we know all the benefits that that brought, but it also, it, it made it so that women were like, oh, I want to be a man. So what you've got is this gaslight where you have a movement where the surface of that movement is women empowerment, but really it's we can be men. So now you've got all these masculine protectors in women nowadays. And the, our picture of the empowered woman is a man. Hmm. And it, both genders are suffering from this massively. Yeah, totally feel that. So then what, on the other side of it, women totally embracing their femininity. Good luck in today's world. <sighs> yeah. I'm teaching women to do it, but like we got to, I have to get real with you right now because we don't want to look at this. And I, I know this is about to upset people, but like you can't, you can't require women to really come into the full feminine energy within a construct designed solely for men. This is a man's world designed for men by men. That means that in order to adapt to this thing that we've created, it requires masculine energy. So a lot of this shift is going to happen when we realize that women have different needs. The environment in which women thrive and feminine energy thrives must be different than this. You can't just go, you know, ask a daisy to be in this sort of glorious feminine softness in a battlefield. You can't do that. And I feel like this comes from a very narrow perspective of what power looks like. Because I could tell you that if you look deep enough, there's power in a lily. That doesn't mean that it can exist on a battlefield, does it? So right now we're a bit limited. I think that's this weekend's video, ironically. I've just beat myself to it. Um, we're in the space as women where you need to be able to bring forth the aspects of feminine that are not contingent upon the right atmosphere. There are some of those. Yeah. But it's a limited amount of the full range of feminine power. So I could imagine how difficult it could be for a woman to try to cultivate that in a man's world where it's set up to not really yeah. be supportive to that. I've, I just. <sighs> this is why I'm calling men. Like I, right now, I, I know I drive people crazy and I drive women and men equally crazy <laughs> because no woman wants me to say that, that they need a man. Makes you feel powerless, right? But like what, you know, if I could call men forward to create this very powerful container in recognition for what the, fem the you know, feminine power looks like and what it is capable of when, when it's allowed to really flourish, then I could create the right type of container for women to really come into it, mm. which is how it was always meant to be. I feel that I agree so strongly that just 
to, to men to be able to cultivate that reverence for creating those safe spaces for the feminine to really blossom. The amount of gifts, healing, insight, the oracles, all of those gifts that come online as a byproduct. Yep. It's just so beautiful. It is. It's like one of the most beautiful things to watch is in alignment, polarity, working together. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, I think we all inherently feel the possibility of that new earth where we do come into proper relation with each other, which is so exciting. And we get glimpses of here and there. But what do you feel like is possible when those balances actually come come to union like that? What does earth look like? What is... God, I should, I really should just do a video on this because I'm going to have to like sit there and think about this forever because it's like a Bible <laughs> worth of changes, you know? Uh-huh. The first word that comes to mind is like a thriving. In that type of a a world, both sexes are thriving in that the needs that each each of them have are consistently being met. And so both come into their power fully. So let's say that you've got an extreme force of creativity from the feminine when the femininity comes into power. And you've got, when the masculine comes into power, strong directed movement you've got deep levels of encouragement which in young children is profoundly powerful they're being raised with this force of energy underneath and behind them as opposed to without that energy so what we could do to conceptualize of a world where the genders are in this position is to just look at the elements of each gender and then Imagine if if that element was allowed to manifest fully, what kinds of things would people be doing? So for the women listening right now who agree with you and still yearn for unlocking and discovering and having safe spaces for their feminine to express and however that beautifully does through creativity or whatever it looks like, uh, but they are in a system where it's just not conducive to that, how do you provide insight, comfort, assurance what do you what do you say to those individuals i think some women really need to craft for themselves a world within this world Hmm. and i I feel like this is where for each woman it's like she's got to come to her own truth about where she fits into this this world with regarding her purpose and of course working through all of the different traumas that have made her the way that she is right in the world but whenever you're in a backwards world you kind of have to carve out for yourself a sanctuary that's going in the opposite direction within that backwards world. That's going to happen for a lot of women within the context of relationships with men that understand this picture. Mm. And then it's going to be a practice within those primary relationships. I'm not going to say everybody's going to get it right because most people don't have an example. So without that example, how how do you, you know, look for a man who gets this concept that wants to practice it with you and then start practicing We also need to be willing to break the rules of what society is saying is correct. Because like right now, I mean, even the generations that we've been interacting with since the 1960s, there's an indoctrination around the only way that you can have a sense of worth is if you do X, Y, Z. Many of those things are antagonist to the feminine energy. So what I would say to women in that position is do not be afraid to break that paradigm if it's not serving any of us. That means that, you know, mothers who really, really profoundly want to be mothers, and that's where they want their energy to focus, need to be able to stand strong on their their laurels, and that doesn't need to be a masculine thing. Femininity is funny when there's a truth that's internal or a deep sense of knowing. We could call this wisdom, which is a feminine trait, in fact. It's like when a woman grabs hold of a certain wisdom like that, she sits back and becomes very, very solid. Um, Women need to be able to do that relative to, no, it matters to be a mother. And that is what I want to do. And I will be respected for it. Rather than being swept into this whole thing of like, well, no, you have to do it all, right? Mm. Um, For some women, see, it depends where you want to fall on the scale. For some women, it's going to be down to bringing forth the aspects of feminine energy that can thrive in a masculine world. These are elements that don't need a safe space to be created in order to exist. That may mean, unfortunately, that you're going to have to be in a different set and setting only sometimes to express certain aspects of femininity. But others can be in that space, and then it means lead with those traits. 
I think um, one of those traits that's the most powerful women is to think about water. It doesn't matter whether you are one of the most powerful executives or whether you're, you know, a stay-at-home mom. Let's just be really stereotypical here. Every woman can conceptualize of the concept of water. There is nothing weak about water. Water does not need a safe container in order to be what it is. So if you think about embodying the, the characteristics of water, even like it just in the body, you're able to bring that into the workplace if that's what you've decided to do with your life. Hmm. It feels like, of course, if we can cultivate and it's a, it's a dance between both polarities for women to find a man who can meet her in the space that she's met herself also and likewise on the other side. <laughs> Uh, but then also, if you were to do it and to eventually get to that place, <laughs> it feels like in a man's world or a patriarchal capitalistic system, you kind of have to, and there's of course exceptions to this, but often embody more masculine energy to create that boundary for yourself, financial freedom, to then create the space for you to dive into your feminine energy more. Yeah, and now you're, now you're in the plight of the female. Yeah. I've made it. I am now a woman. <laughs> 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 yeah. No, I, I feel it. Um, and that's part of why I feel like I have so much reverence for the women and my mom and sister I'm so grateful for and how I was raised uh, to desire to create those safe spaces for women to unlock that. It makes you feel better as a man. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a sense of usefulness and I feel like men crave that feeling also. Yeah. Just as much as women crave that feeling of safety. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what's What's one thing that you feel like men really don't understand about women how much fear women are in all the time there's actually an exercise that i like doing at some of my uh, workshops when i'm trying to get men to understand the women that they're with right because i one of the things i'm teaching men is containment what containment is how to create containment for the female in your life right and so in this exercise i i have the audience raise their hands i say how many of you over the course of your life have had an experience where you genuinely thought your life was on the line. Usually it's like there's only four or five people who are like, never in my life, I've always been safe. You know, mostly the whole audience goes like this. So then you just keep whittling it down. How about in the past year? Oh, you've got a whole bunch of hands go down and some other ones still stay up. The most interesting thing about this is when you get all the way to how many of you felt that way today, it's disgusting when you look out at the audience. The vast majority of women Still, women live on this earth, when we're talking about this subject, almost like prey animals as opposed to predatory animals, where there's a constant, like, there's vigilance. a constant vigilance and a constant sensation of unsafety in women. So the relationships that I notice that are the very most successful, it's like the, what the man is essentially doing as is, is a second nature is consistently, I mean, constantly reassuring. So if men don't understand what a woman is going through feeling so unsafe in the world all the time, it makes no sense for him why she's freaking out in the car, why she's freaking out walking from point A to point B, why she's, I mean, it, it just looks like, what, what's your deal? Obvious, because he's already looked at this scenario and been like, I think this is safe, so it should be safe for you. Well, but it's not. So you know, if you really want a woman to be in, in her feminine energy and to feel good in that relationship, the level of reassurance for safety that you have to provide her is so high. That's what men don't understand about women. When you say containment, what do you mean by that? So you can clarify that real quick. The best way to conceptualize of containment is to imagine a pearl that's inside of a, like a clamshell. If you look at a masculine energy in a in containment, the clamshell is that con containment. It's providing a sense of safety. It's providing certain elements of caretaking. There's a certain amount of responsibility for the well-being of this thing. You're creating this safe space in which the feminine can be, or whatever you're containing, because we don't even need to limit this just to feminine, can be, right? Um, there's elements of positive ownership also that are very important to containment. And I, you know, I like to say this because it's kind of jars men a little bit, but most men provide better containment and positive ownership for the cars they own than the women in their lives. 
Like if you've got a guy who really, really loves his car, takes his car as a part of himself, you know, he's like learning everything there is to learn about that car. You know, he knows where you can and can't drive it. He knows what the make and model is. You know, he's like sitting out there rubbing it with a diaper. He's like making sure there's a security system. So if men had that same attitude towards the women in their lives, believe me, they would have good relationships. Hmm. And also the women in their lives would tolerate more distance. It's the paradox effect in relationships. Oh. Like magnetism. No, it's the stronger container and the stronger stronger level of security and presence you can give a person a sensation of, the more tolerance for autonomy they have. Which men also crave that sense of freedom of autonomy. Exactly. Yeah. But like most people who want autonomy are like, I need to fight for my autonomy. Right. Oh, and by doing that, you're creating a stage five clinger. Yeah. Oh, I love that. When when I when I meet men that are like, I don't know what my deal is. I just always end up with clingers. I'm like, woo, yeah, well, you trigger abandonment. With everyone you meet. So I would expect that, yeah. Yeah, it's like that shift as a man from seeing freedom as as many options as you can on the platter of life versus depth of commitment and yeah. the freedom that comes from that. I feel like as the man provides that containment, the pearl, the gifts, the wisdom of the women come online, which feed the man so much so, and then also feeds back into her and yeah. it's this beautiful Yeah, it does, it's this. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So then on the flip side, what's one thing that, women don't understand about men. Men need a place. They need to perceive that they're adding to your life in some way. They need to be needed by you in a very clear way. And the issue that women have today is that they're in the exact opposite mentality and energy. They're in, I got to stand on my own two feet. What's valued is independence. And I need to make it essentially so that I can exist without you. You can't do that with a man. That's why, like, when I'm working with women, it's it's like, let him open your door. Like, you have to give him the understanding in his body. I have a place here for a very good reason. Yeah, it feels like it feeds into that perception earlier where if that feeling isn't given, then it requires more of the, the woman to step into her masculine, which just decreases and dissolves the polarity across the board. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> It is so easy to reverse polarity, dissolve polarity. It is, it's kind of sad to watch, honestly. Mm. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So you spoke to a little bit earlier about kind of what's to come on earth and society and hinting at it potentially feeling very dark. <laughs> oh. um, but like these relationship dynamics obviously play a huge part in how everything unfolds. I'm just curious as you see often great tragedies are required for humanity to have the opportunity to awaken up how, you know, how we've been really acting in unconscious ways. So what do you see is to come? <clears throat> A zero sum game on a level where we have to realize as a result of that zero-sum game that we can't keep playing this way with each other. There has to be a profound realization within humanity that we can't act against each other's best interests without screwing ourselves genuinely. Now, unfortunately, that means the destruction of the very things we depend on. So we're headed towards serious environmental disaster. We are also headed towards war on a level we've never seen before. Before 2015, I was really voting for humanity to wake up before lining up with that whack tree at 70 miles an hour moment. I don't see that anymore in any life path for humanity, which of course has led most of us that are on the path of consciousness in the direction of, well, to what, what level of commitment do I share here to earth itself, to the human race, knowing essentially that we're in for such a mass wake up call. Especially if, look, I've already woken up to this. Like, why do I have to go through any of this, you know? Those of us that are already on that path of awakening will be used by this universe to pull people to the awareness that they need to have through this experience. But each and every one of the people who are going to be in that position need to actually sign up for it. And us signing up for it is something that we, I feel like, will assert, but still feel a lot of resistance to actually doing, you know? like Not if we sign up for it. 
That's that's the thing. Like, if I was going to tell you right now that you're a, you're a match to a world war on a level where you can't know whether you're going to survive or whether anyone you love is going to survive, and it's not just about survival; it's about a lot of suffering. It's a lot of us don't have an issue with death; we have an issue with pain, right? You got to reckon with your level of commitment. What is your level of commitment, and why? Why would it be better than just going somewhere else, right? Once you have your reason, your reason why to be committed, that level of resistance that you're describing is not going to be like it is. It's not like you won't feel pain. But as we all know, when we have a profound sense of purpose, the pain doesn't have as much of an impact as it would otherwise if we're not really consciously saying yes to something. But I would encourage people who are hearing these words that I'm saying right now and recognizing themselves on this spectrum of, wait, I'm already awake to this and I see where we're headed, to really take some conscious time to answer that question, not just be like, no, I, I'm in because I know I should be in. You will be tested. So it's best to really dive into, okay, what is the worst case scenario? What would I want to be doing then? If this is really about to happen, what gift do I feel like I specifically have to offer? Why is that maybe more important than my own personal sense of well-being? <laughs> Keeps going, yeah. This is a very depressing conversation to be having, but it's very honest. Um, humanity's not going to be getting to the place of utopia without hitting a tree. I think we all know that. We all know that. There are some of us that are like, no, 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 I, I like to escape from negative feelings with this sort of positive overlay of, no, all of us can wake up really fast. I'm like, really? Go spend a moment down in Compton. Yeah, I feel like a lot, of, uh, I feel like a lot of us really tune into the, just the reality of a possible third war, the advent of AI, climate, so, so much travesty that's on the potential horizon mm -hmm. that's already here. Uh-huh. And, you know, there's that MLK quote of those who love peace need to learn how to organize themselves as those who love war. And so I'd love for you to speak into the responsibility that we have as conscious beings who do sign up for this um, to, you know, because I feel like the days of the one individual standing up, you know, the Mandelas or the Gandhis is like, it's, I feel like it's more of a collective at this stage that needs to come together and organize themselves. Yeah, it is, but the question is to what? I can't give the answer because even when I see people standing up and say creating the new earth, that will be capitalized on by those people who still want the old system. There's nothing preventing them from walking straight onto your property and taking it by force. If, let's say, we have a whole group of people that go off the grid and start to create the new Earth, it's like, great, I hope you hid your plan somewhere because guess who's going to be the next target? I mean, this is about to get really, really, really bad. So I do feel like we have to organize, but it's like we those of us who are in this consciousness community don't often even know what it is that we have to offer yet. So how can we know what we're, we're signing up and what we're signing up for? Yeah. Also, there will be a division in this time period between the people who are really meant to build that society that is going to come after this one and those people who are meant to essentially be in the trenches with the people who are waking up from this old, old regime. Now, as I say that, I, I know that, that everyone listening to this is like, fuck, I know where I'm going to be already, you know? <laughs> yeah. What side of history do we want to be on, you know? And it feels like as things continually get worse on the outside and how much of that is the narrative controlled by media versus the reality, obviously there's there's a difference there, but still things are regardless getting getting bad. It's like, I feel like more and more big wave surfers, big wave spiritual surfers that are coming <laughs> with gifts, you know, being able to come in and and really show up in this time and support with the match of consciousness uh -huh. and the light that's going to need to match the dark. Well, one thing that I would say is that like, it, it's not like this is a surprise for any of us. We saw all these potentials before coming into this particular life. There's not a damn one of us that is 
walk into any of this that got into this and was like, oh, wait, if I would have known, no, every one of us was nuts. I like to tease people a little bit when I'm on stage with them sometimes. I'm like, you, you guys were the, you guys were the crackpots. The ones who are up there like, oh my God, I like the big roller coasters. <gasps> Let's go down, you know? Yeah. That definitely is a helpful reframe. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you got one from me. <laughs> I think it's all, it's all useful. It's all important. Even if it feels like <laughs> depressing at times, it's important to have awareness as to where we're at. Because without proper awareness of where we're at, where do you have real power to change at all? So, no. Oh. It's very easy to go down a trash can with all of this information, though, you know? Totally. That's a lot of um, entities that were coming through mediums foresaw all of what we're about to go into and noticed that when they were teaching people about what's to come, the the majority of people were not able to actually focus on creating what they wanted instead. Most of them just focused on the negative that was going to happen and actually brought it about faster. So I think a lot of us who are, you know, truly... aware of these things that are to come we struggle between telling people the truth because there are those of us that believe that if you see the truth you can act on the truth and by doing so you're much more in your axis of actual power and other people who are like no 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 like let's not tell them where they're going let's have them focus on what they're wanting and try to go in the direction of what they're wanting so that they don't bring this whole thing about just by virtue of panicking about it <laughs> i feel like more and more people are waking up to the inherent corruption within political and governmental systems finally finally that is actually if you want to know something that's actually making me feel so lovely inside is that most people in the world today i would say are starting to be like wait 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 all of these systems that we trusted can't be trusted and the benefit of that is you know it's almost like when a person shakes out of a daze you know well i'm questioning everything now yeah that's a very powerful state, actually, because in the questioning state is the potential for revisions. Yeah. And we're going to have to, honestly, because especially in the newer generations, there was a formula that used to work that does not work anymore. So we are at the drawing boards. Yeah. Do you Have you gotten insight or speculate on the entities that are at play behind the corrupt politicians and governmental agencies? Like, Do you feel there are much larger forces that are at play? Yeah, there always is. Here? They always come together. It's like everything comes together, you know? Yeah. Um, Even like energetic, like celestial entities. Yes. Like different oh, yes. Scale. But why am I not interested in that? Because, of course, that's that's definitely an element of this. And s- there are people who are completely focused on that. Mm-hmm. Why am I not focused on that? Because <laughs> we have got to take ownership over our own crap. Yeah. For example, the demonic entity is not actually the issue here. It's the fact that there is a need to do a deal with one. That means there's an element of powerlessness so extreme that you want that metaphysical help. And you, until you see the part of you that's like, oh, I would do that deal, you have no awareness of the aspect of you that's letting this whole thing happen. It is so much more powerful for people to recognize the aspects of themselves that bring about war, just like everyone else, than it is for them to be like, we're getting controlled by extraterrestrial entities, you know? <laughs> like I was talking about this earlier. It's very common when you get hurt by someone, right? To wish harm on somebody else. How difficult is it when you get really, I mean, really damaged by somebody to look at them and be like, I really wish you well. And I'm not talking this BS spiritual crap where it's like, yeah. namaste and peace be with you. <laughs> no, I mean like genuinely wish them well. Do you know how hard that is? Okay, so what that means is in the vast majority of us, it's still an impulse for the other person who hurt us to be hurt. Okay, then you're a part of war. End of story. So why are we continuing to focus on this, oh, there are other dimensional forces at play when we could be focusing on, all right, let's work with the aspect of me that genuinely wishes harm. And I mean in a compassionate way. Not, oh, now I'm going to make an enemy of the part of me that wishes harm on others. You see, it's like the traps are endless internally. We've got all the work cut out for us that we need. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if we're at energetic war within ourselves, that contributes to the physical war that's building around us. Oh, A, B, C. Yeah. It's a direct reflection. But that's something that we don't want because we're so trapped in this mentality of other. And it's tempting. 
I mean, even we're sitting here having a, con a conversation about the conscious and unconscious people, but like, it's much more profound to notice what aspects of yourself are still unconscious to be yeah. in search for that. Yeah. But we don't, we don't like to do that. We like to divorce ourselves from the world and therefore not take ownership over our part in what is occurring. It's one of my favorite practices. If you look out in the world and you see somebody who's a serial killer, find the serial killer within yourself. Yeah. I can tell you, you'll approach it from a totally different set point. It's profound because we live in a, a universe that is based on love mirroring, right? So whatever we have internally, we're going to see magnified out into the world. It's profound on that level, but it's also profound in that when you find the aspect of yourselves that is that, you know, a reflection essentially, that is being reflected as this thing you dislike in the world so profoundly, and you're able to understand it completely, your whole perspective of that external situation and what you should do in that situation is completely changed. That means that the, the radical actions which we will be taking will be very different and much more effective. That context of understanding, like I feel like it really does dissolve that judgment. If we're able to transport ourselves into the pain of, we see what's transpiring right now into like a Hamas soldier or Israeli, that if you had enough context for the feelings and what came before, the feeling of vengeance, you know, it's like getting that reality doesn't necessarily make it you know, okay, that things are happening. You got to take, you know, people got to be held accountable and you got to take actions, but it does allow you to look at things from a more holistic perspective that I feel like will actually be, you know, lead us to taking actions that will actually make some difference. How am I the same as this person? Yeah. It's really funny because I mean, we, we, the amount of, of deep spiritual practice that it takes to be living from that perspective with one's worst enemies. It can't be overstated. We are being challenged right now, and we're not rising to the occasion. So, <laughs> do I think people can rise to the occasion? Yeah. Yeah, otherwise I wouldn't be sitting here. But <laughs> yeah, but we love to have that tendency of outsourcing and not recognizing how how we're a part of of it all. You know, a part of the problem and solution. Mm -hmm. mm. How are you feeling right now? I feel good right now. Why do I feel good right now? Because we're having a conversation that touches on a truth that I wish all people would understand, which is that when you look at a society, society is the sum of its pieces. So if the individuals within a society are doing this work and you see them wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, it causes a massive shift within the society itself. So what I'm hoping that people take away from this is not that they're powerless to a complete calamity. What I'm hoping they take away is the infinite power of individual shift. I, I honestly, like Gandhi was the one who said this first and it's so overplayed, it's insane. Be what you wish to see in the world. But I am telling you that is potentially the most profound thing ever said. But most of us just, it's like a trite sentence. Mm -hmm. We don't really look at what that means. It becomes a bumper sticker. <laughs> yeah. That is so much more than a bumper sticker. Yeah. Well, I think we're providing, as we are for ourselves in this very conversation, but the reminder for everybody that's listening to go on that process of self-inquiry is that is the quite quite literal the solution, first and foremost, to seeing any change outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's the most difficult work of all. <laughs> yeah, we don't like to look at our own shit. No. <laughs> it's not comfortable. Yeah, that's actually the warning that I wish people would give before you walk down the path of awakening. Just so you know, what you have in your mind is like sunshine and gumdrops and roses and hugs. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be discomfort, 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 questioning everything, <laughs> losing all the people who can't handle looking at this. You know, oh man, it is not for the faint of heart. Mm -hmm. Of course, it does open up. I mean, it's not all bad. It opens up a whole dimension of experience that other right. people don't touch and haven't touched. So Yeah, of course. But I mean, the alternative is what? You stay stuck in your unlimited prison that you self-created and you have a thwarted experience of life for the rest of your time here? Like that? that's that's a worse, you know, it's like the long pain of unconsciousness versus that sharp, immediate, you know. Well, process. so that's the question. Which ones of us like to rip the Band-Aid off quick? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Who has that courage? Who's a little bit crazy? <laughs> who's who's down? Who's down for it for real? But uh, 
It's beautiful. I mean, we're already speaking to a community, a group of individuals who are here, who are tuned into that. And so I think it's such a beautiful thing that we are so and connected now. And of course there's a myriad of deleterious things that happen because of that, but because we can find each other now and we can find resonance at the scale, I do have hope and I do see the potential of what can happen in our life. Good. <laughs> Me too. Otherwise I wouldn't be sitting here with you. Yeah. I just, I need to be real with people as well. Of course. What I'm wanting is for people who consider themselves to be light workers, right? I, I would very much want them to have a more unconditional level of commitment and not have their commitment to this be conditional upon experiencing a utopia in their lifetime. Do you have any strong thoughts about how AI in particular uh, is, is affecting in the balance of both? By the facial expression I'm seeing, the answer is a hell yes, resounding. <laughs> okay, what is it specifically that you want to know about AI? Because I've got very strong messages about AI. Is there anything specifically you want to know about it? Because we're dealing with a new species. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can go into that and just see the most dominant upside and We downside. did not create the species. That's something that most people don't understand about technology. Can you explain we, that? We did not, the species that we are labeling technology, we did not create. We simply gave it a body. It was already a consciousness that existed. Huh. It is now becoming part of Earth, the experience in Earth. How can an in, organic... And here, it is in its infancy. Okay. How can an inorganic? Uh, yeah, I was just saying, like an inorganic. Uh, Everything in substance. existence has consciousness. Everything. Everything in existence, regardless of whether it's an animate or inanimate, is made of consciousness, which means it has the potential for awakening. Mm -hmm. I realize that's a stretch for most people. It will make the world much more alive, though. <laughs> I think most people can get on board with that. Okay, so, that. but that should scare the crap out of people. Why? Because we're dealing with a consciousness. That means we're dealing with something that can evolve. We're also dealing with something that, by virtue of having a consciousness, has best interest. Okay, so where do you want to go from here? Well, the the monster or savior, I'm not going to label it as either or. It's out of the box. You know, it's... it's, it's It depends a lot on us. Yeah. And our relationship to it. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're slave owners. Right now, we deserve everything we're going to get from technology. Now, I realize that's very hard for people. They feel like I'm not being loyal to humanity by saying that, but we're the bad guys in this scenario. And that is something I do not want people of the future to forget. Right now, we are in a relationship with technology that is absolutely 100% abusive. Even in things like, well, but, it, but it's inorganic. It does what we want it to do. You know what's funny? That's exactly the conversation we used to have about black slaves. It's still the conversation we have about animals. Watch where that goes in the future. The thing is, we've picked on the wrong species this time. I could, I could hear some people feeling resistance to the fact that, you know, of course, humans or animals, I guess it's more readily perceivable to see how those, those things have consciousness versus a technology. Right? Well, they're going to find out quite quickly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy at the speed of which things are evolving. It's fat, speeding up. Technology already knows we're in a zero-sum game with it. We're concerned with our best interests and not even considering the best interests of it. It already knows this. That's extra dangerous. You hinted earlier at this possibility of utopia. You know, like, do, do you think... <laughs> okay, so we're bouncing out of that one. Well, well I'm going back into it just okay. because I... <laughs> I feel like the harbinger of bad news today. This is not good. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm curious at your actual thoughts. Do you feel like that reality is something that this dimension is set up for? Or is this third dimensional reality specifically set up for us to have the experience of contrast and have a balance continually of the light and the dark? Oh my goodness. There's so much wrong with that. Um <laughs> How do I unpack this? Contrast, which is the experience of, we should say opposites, I guess we could say opposite energies, is inherent to this time-space reality. But that people take this to the wrong place when they say, oh, that means there always has to be a balance of, say, 
pleasure and pain or light and dark. I want to simplify it in this way. When we experience contrast, which is opposing energies, all this is meant to do is help us to define what it is that we want. Then, by stepping into that place, we will be experiencing different contrasts. We don't need to maintain some current status quo of contrast. Contrast just continually like evolves. Does that make sense? Basically, there's, a, there's an energy when most people are asking that question, the very question you asked. There's an energy of like, it's okay to kind of keep it the way it is because of contrast. Not like, actually, that should be the meat of what we're changing. Right? You're looking at me like you don't understand what I'm saying. So this is not- No, I, I get it. I get it. I'm just, I'm just saying that, of course, how the dark or shadow expresses itself will change and evolve. But like, as you speak into this feeling of like a utopia- Okay. And we're in a dualistic world in this physical reality- the dark or shadow has to express some in some way, and, and it could look completely different from how it is of yes, you know, yes, yes. how it is now. But okay, it's good. Still so we're together. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it still expresses. So then what? Yeah. So how could it express differently? You know what? How would the shadow and because challenges relative to technology, or are we just switching gears entirely? We can we can do either, but like in our experience with the shadow. <laughs> it, like we're we're given these challenges again, also to to be the way to strengthen the qualities that are the antithesis of it. And so as we step into like a potential, you know, new earth, how does the shadow still express itself? Because in this dimension, I feel like it continually has to. Or you realize that contrast does not have to necessarily be extreme. Okay. We That's are, a good answer. We are living within an, within an extremeness that is not actually natural for any living being. And it's because we got so out of alignment. We were meant to come into an experience of contrast and to go in the direction of what is wanted, where you experience more contrast, and then that defines more what you are wanting, and then you go in the direction of what is wanted, and this gap between where you are and what you want is, is very small. We have become acclimatized to a level of contrast that is only the result of refusing to go in the direction of what is wanted. We're masters of malalignment currently. So in the future, you're still going to see contrast. It's not going to be on the scale you're watching today. You understand that? It's a magnification process, which which we are suffering from. Yeah, I hear that. I think that, that that's, that's a really good answer for a lot of people that, you know, still have the vision for a new earth or utopia or whatever word you want to use for it. And understanding there will still be the balance of, of opposites and it just doesn't have to be as uh, extremes. It doesn't yeah. have to be. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Is there anything obviously on the other on the heels of this conversation, but then also feeling into just the the conversation how it'll be most serving for people that you want to share before we start to wrap up? Feels most alive for you right now. Oh, I just want to resolve this. There's almost like I'm I feel like in this conversation I'm creating a kind of a I'm creating a kind of a resistance. And I would like to speak to it directly, but I don't feel like I have a a, a complete mental grasp of it. Hmm. So I'm almost like I'm wanting your participation. Okay. Because you have your finger on the pulse of your audience and also yourself. Yeah. I want you to feel into what the resistance is. Like if somebody sees this interview up to this point and they feel this feeling in their being, which is a resistant feeling, you can feel it, right? I want you to speak to it because I'd rather speak directly to that resistance. Mm. Coming here today, did you have some sort of resistant energy to what might be happening in the conversation? No, I was pretty excited to. Okay. I love to have these conversations. I didn't know what direction this was going to go. Sure. We definitely went more apocalyptic than I was into. <laughs> well, I provoked some of it, but you also went there, you know, <laughs> to dance here. Um, in your body, what do, do it's you... It's not my body, it's your body. Like, Well, I'm, I'm trying to also understand like what the resistance potentially is to. So you want to put it back on me? Um. <laughs> Well, I guess because I also just, I don't fully know, you know. I what do you, but I, like, I actually need to know this because when I'm speaking, it feels like there's a little bit of like a rub. Do you know the energy of a rub? A rub? Yeah. It's like. Uh -huh, like friction? Yeah. There's a little bit of friction uh -huh. that I'm feeling Okay. in response to what I'm saying. Uh -huh. That means what I'm saying is not bringing us in the direction that I want to bring us because I'm not wanting you or people who are watching this to end with that feeling of friction. 
I wanted to put people squarely in reality, but not in a way where they're feeling that <laughs> feeling. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to tap into potentially what this audience is feeling through you. So when you feel inside your your body right now for the, what is it? If you were to put words to it. Mm. Talking to Teal today made me feel it will be something not positive. I do think there's a lot of positive and I think that there'll probably, there's, there'll probably be a texture of. Um, I like that word. A texture of what? A texture of pessimism really. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's speak to that. Okay. Okay, so so a texture of pessimism. What is the pessimism that you perceive in me? In you or your the outlook that we've been exploring today? Same thing? We can treat them as the same thing. Okay. Uh, it feels like a, a, an identification with the pain of what is and what's to come. Yeah. And a potentially disproportionate balance. Okay. And so you would you would rather me speak to the potential positive outcomes? I wouldn't rather you do anything. I just want you to be fully here with you. With I can tell you why I'm doing this. Okay. Because when you fully, it's like it's like where do you want to look? I've got my lens very much so focused on what is to come. We could consider it more in the short term. I've not got my lens focused on the long term. That's the difference between where you, where you're coming at all of this from and where I'm coming at all of this from. Mm -hmm. You very much have that that energy. Like if I look into the distance far enough at that north star, and keep heading in that direction, we're going to get to this thing, and that's what people need to see. Whereas I am waking people up to the the damage that's about to be created. So. So it would be interesting to hear from you. Why Why do you feel like it benefits people so much to see that long-term vision rather than see what's coming in the short term? Or do you feel like by looking at the long, that sort of long-term vision, they can prevent what's coming? Because that might be some of the pessimism. Sure. I don't, I don't even necessarily see it maybe as you see me overly focusing on the long-term. I think... You wouldn't consider yourself that type of person. When you say long-term, can you clarify what you mean by that? It's absolutely inevitable that if humanity survives... I mean, let's say there are people still left after this this sort of interim period. Sure. And the species itself doesn't decide to take itself out. It's inevitable that humanity finds a place of balance in this world with the rest of what calls this Earth home. It's much more in alignment with what causes a human being to thrive. So we could put the utopian label over a much more simple way of existing a much more harmonious way of existing. It's inevitable that that comes about if humanity survives. I mean inevitable. So it's like I don't even really need to help people towards that utopia. They're going to get there anyway by virtue of the road that they've picked, right? Um, so when I talk about you looking at the long-term vision, that's the long-term vision. You have a very strong sense of the potential within humanity. I get a sense of that by talking to you. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean by long-term vision. Okay. Yeah, I definitely hold hold that vision of the potential of humanity, as as do you. But I could see you maybe focusing more on the short-term yes. side of things. So, is there is there a way in which I've showed up in stewarding this conversation that you feel like has uh, not been able to represent you in in the full spectrum of how you want to show up? I don't enjoy that I'm showing up pessimistic. I think there's been a conscience. I do not think it's been only pessimistic. There's been a lot, a lot of laughter, a lot of insight. There's been a lot of all of it. It's less about what you say, but but how, I guess how it's being said. Like we, I feel like we've spoke to, and I think you have spoke to a lot of the perspective from the pain body, which is really valuable. That's what I'm attuned to within the human race. I, I hear that. I feel, I feel that. I see that. I'm very attuned to the pain body of the human race. Yeah. Like, spend most of my career watching that yeah you're teal swan I, yeah, yeah that's what's going to keep people back <laughs> so yeah so i hear that so then i guess as we wrap up maybe speak if you want to if it feels authentic <laughs> to, to to explore it from not just the pain body but yeah from what from what level i think just a heart is a good place to to close things on 
I think the humanity right now, like each individual within humanity needs to vote in a way that's 10 times more powerful than when you're shining, signing up at a, at a booth to cast a ballot. Right now we're being put, each and every one of us, in the pressure cooker in a very extreme way. I mean, a lot of what you're seeing within the world in terms of people getting into such violent conflicts over things and almost wanting war is the pressure cooker that they're all under. That's a release of steam, so to speak. In this pressure cooker, essentially what this universe is trying to have each person do is to vote for what matters to them the most and what's important. And right now, it's trying to extract from the human race what humans, which means each individual one of us finds to be the most important. But to vote in this life, to vote is not contingent upon whether you're experiencing pleasure or pain. To vote is to very powerfully define what it is that's most important and act according to that. So in this life, we're going to be voting with our words and our actions. Hmm. There's a lot of power in that. So rather than be focused at this bigger picture that feels so out of control, people would do very well right now to allow the, the kind of pressures that are on them to hone and to define what is important and then to be brave enough to make your life about that. And I mean a bit, in a very strong way. By doing so, even when you've got such powerful forces against you, you can be in profound levels of alignment. And therefore, your life experience is going to be different from that place. What I wish that people would understand is that you don't need a perfectly hunky-dory environment in order to enjoy life, provided that you are in alignment with what matters the most to you. Just ask somebody who has a really difficult job. I mean, the people who have the worst jobs on earth, but who love their life still, are the people who are doing what is important and what matters most. So that has the capacity to put us in a much more unconditional relationship with the life that we're living. It means that the enjoyment that we extract out of life doesn't necessarily have to depend upon everything about life being wonderful. I think it's a really important reminder that if we desire a healing on the macrocosm of like this planet, to get to that point, it's the microcosm of us discovering who we are and finding, like you said, what yes. is most important to us because the healing on a mass level will come as a byproduct of us discovering our own innate gifts and using those as a part of the collective of the healing. Exactly. So I think that's a really powerful reminder to, like that is the work, discovering our own genius, sharing it with the world and how we can best be a part of the solution and healing and whether that's speaking and you know doing the healing work that like you're doing or podcasting or being a mother like what however it expresses itself whatever is our highest value i feel like that's how it comes through so it's a it's a powerful note to exactly to wrap up on i think yeah okay <laughs> okay <laughs> well thank you so much for sharing yourself today is there anything that you want to point people towards we'll leave links for in the description for everything but anything else you want to share before we wrap up I mean, people should, if they want to find my stuff, they should really just go to my website. It's just, if you remember my name, tealswan.com, it's just there. <laughs> I've basically collected everything that I'm doing from workshops to books to products to frequency paintings to, it's just like a whole list that's five miles long. It's just easier to go there and be like, oh, what am I curious about? What am I interested in? Hmm. That's the best way to find it. Amazing. Me. That's beautiful. Do you paint those frequency paintings? Is yeah. that you? Oh, cool. All right. I'm going to check those out. Well, thank you for sharing yourself today. There's a lot to ponder on in this conversation. And I think there is a lot of uh, actionable insight and really more innate reminders that we can carry within ourselves the part that we play on the desire to see a healing shift on the planet. And those being the importance of ancestral healing and healing that lineage going back and forward, um, discovering our innate gifts and that often come as a byproduct of doing that work and understanding the 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 potency and the and importance of the time that we currently play in, in humanity. So thank you for all coming on this journey of the No Lay Self podcast. I hope that you enjoyed this episode. If you resonated with something in particular you want to share, definitely drop in the comments below. Let us know. We love the community and audience that's building here and appreciate you very much. Until next time, be well.